here. From where people got the idea about living in a protected environment, you know, like in a bubble, or somehow going out and looking for the perfect community to live in. You know, Christian neighbors, Christian school, Christian life, Christian church. You know, the nice, perfect little community with the nice, perfect little children, and kind of like the Stepford Wives effect. Only this would be the Stepford husbands, the Stepford children. Everybody in a nice, neat, even row. I don't know where we got that idea, but somehow that's becoming more popular as we hear people talking about something called the Christian nation. I don't know about you, but my vision of America is not all Christian. My vision of America is what it is today. Diverse, multiple peoples, coming from a variety of environments and world events, all wanting to do be and exist in a place where they could call home and choosing to live their life according to what they understand life to be. I understand that part. I don't get sometimes some of my brothers and sisters who are Christians telling me things that they call America. I kind of look at it and think, it sounds like a dictatorship to me and it makes me a little nervous when you start doing that because quite frankly, once you get everyone the way you want them to be, then you start separating them out again. And that's kind of what's happened throughout Christendom. There's always this movement to create a utopian society. I remember in my studies of American history at the turn of the century, utopianism was popular. Jeffersonian state was kind of like, hey, we wanted to create something more than a democracy. Ooh, be careful about what you read in history. It may not be exactly what you think. Or, you know, the Washington plantation was a plantation. Let's be real. And while people change to age, it doesn't mean that they don't have the basic tendencies to condone and be a participant in things that aren't Christian. And so, while I understand there being some people that want to rewrite Christian history, I don't think that you know rewriting history is such a good idea when you start changing the facts to make them fit your comfortability. And that's what makes me a little nervous about some of these things when people talk about you know they want to only you know enforce certain rules and regulations and that the world is coming to an end and that you know oh no Christians are going to you know become a minority. Christians have always been a minority. I don't know where the idea has been misappropriated, but there's been a big political movement now of when Christians were so politically active, they thought they were in charge. Well, God's in charge. I mean, quite frankly, it doesn't matter how you vote or what you vote or what you do. I mean, God's still in charge. If you win an election, great. God put him there. If you lost an election, great. God put him there. That's the way it works. God's in charge. Sorry. Bottom line. But there's somehow this idea that, you know, we need to be, you know, like in this real safe greenhouse, hothouse effect, you know, where you want to protect everything. Well, I have plants. Now, I grow tomato plants right now, and my tomato plants are pretty flexible. You know, they bend with the wind. They, none of them have broken yet, but they've been blown over. I mean, they're a good six feet tall, and they've bent all the way over back to the ground even. That's flexibility. But these plants are exposed to the elements. You see, because they're exposed to the elements, they're toughened up. They force their roots to expand outward when the wind blows. When the wind blows upon these plants, it makes the roots grow outward to hold on to the, wind to the soil even more so. Same thing with when they're watered. When the water spreads out, and you spread the water out, the roots spread out. It helps to hold the plants together. It's kind of like, you know, sometimes you see these roots, you know, tree systems that are Well, when you've got a small root ball, it could be knocked over by top winds. It could be toppled. But if that plant or that tree had to reach out to get more water and you kept extending the water out, believe it or not, 
those roots go after the water. Yep, true story. And you know that you know there's certain trees that put roots way down deep, or they'll go way out, you know, like cottonwoods and all kinds of other plants that, or trees that you know don't ever seem to get knocked down by the wind. The reason is because they have deep roots, and they're forced to grow that way by the circumstances of life itself working on them, by the storms of life that come into their life, and that's what you see in Christianity. You don't want to, you know, only protect your children and say, oh, we got to keep them safe. There's a certain amount of truth to that. You want to train them in how to handle the storms of life. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But don't be mistaken. If they so persecuted the master, you know, and they've done this in a good time, imagine what they're going to do in a dry time. They're going to come after you. They're going to get you. They're going to take you out. And that's the bottom line of what Christianity is all about. You are supposed to be able to endure tribulation. You are supposed to have the patience of the saints. You are supposed to be a soldier who is able to endure the hardships and the struggles that go on in life. Not whine about them. More often than not now, I see more of a kind of a, a feely, touchy, kind of like, as long as things are going good, you know, hey, I'm a Christian. But, you know, when things are going wrong, I'm crying out to everybody and blaming Satan and calling out, you know, for prayer and everything else. Maybe God is taking you there. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not against, you know, praying for things, you know, when, you know, you don't know what to do and, you know, asking God for wisdom, you know, James 1, 5. Or, you know, like you're being led by the Lord, you know, and the Lord says, hey, you know what, this is a, a attack from the enemy, so, you know, kind of endure as a good soldier. Put up your shield of faith, you know. Don't pull your sword when you don't need to use it. But, man, most of the time I hear like, oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm struggling because, you know what, I'm reaping what I sowed. Well, no, if you're reaping what you sowed, you did it. It's your fault. You're learning. Hey, pay the price. Move on. Get right. Don't just think that everything's going to be hunky-dory because you've got a story to offer up to everyone around you when, really, your own sin has found you. That's the way it works. You reap what you sow, don't you know? And so, a lot of times, you know, we've got to not rewrite our personal history either, much less our national history, because some of the things that come upon us are our own fault. I mean, people want to yell at the president, and I keep saying, hey, you know, maybe God put the president there to show you where your heart's at. Because the more I see Christians attacking the president, the more I realize, wow, talk about people's hardened of heart, they are off the wall. You know, they're trying to make him out to be like a Muslim or trying to make him out to be this, that, or the other thing. The guy went to church. Give me a break, you know. You want me to look at your church? Huh, I can. You know, do the same thing to your church that you've done to his church, or vice versa. Because in as much as you've judged your brethren, you'll be judged. Hey, you don't like it, but guess what? The man prays. Ain't going too far with that one, but you know what? I may not like everything you do. I may not like everything you believe in. But that doesn't mean that if you tell me you're saved, I'm going to say, no, you're not. Because you see, I don't have the responsibility of judging your salvation. I only have the responsibility of giving you the presentation of the opportunity to know Jesus in a personal, intimate way. From that moment on, you're going your way, you know, and I'm going mine. You know, you may go that way, and I'll say, "Ooh, looks like a cliff, but you know, if you want to go that way, go ahead." You know, I'm heading this way. Let me know how that works out for you. And I'm going the other way, because you see, I choose a more excellent way. I choose the way of not least resistance, but rather a path of the most insistence of God upon my life, where God tells me the direction I should go, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I trust Him for that. I depend upon Him in that. I am challenged by that lots of times. I mean, I think about, you know, how Elijah was. And sometimes I find myself doing the same thing that Elijah did. You know, I... I uh, was sharing with a bro recently and I was intimidated which I sometimes get and the bro was asking me about you know my job and you know I wasn't I'm not working I'm in the ministry so I could have said well I'm in the ministry he said I said well you know he said are you retired I said no he said 
know, what did you used to do? You know, I said, well, you know, I've done this and done that. You know, instead of like saying, well, God put me into ministry. And then just let it go. Because, okay. you see, that would have been the fanatical answer. But you don't always want to look like a fanatic, do you? You don't always want to look like you're kind of like weird or bizarre. Or like, oh, you're one of those. And even among people that you fellowship with. And this man, you know, I'm sure would have wondered, looking at me and going, really? You? Huh. I said, well, you know, that's what I am. You know, I'm a minister, so to speak. When I say minister, so to speak, what I mean is, yes, I'm a man with God. I'm a man of God. I'm a man that God has chosen and directed into doing what I'm doing. Video. Sharing the ministry of relating Jesus in a personal, intimate way to those that want to and need to be encouraged from the Internet, as well as from videos on YouTube, to pursue on, to grow on, to go on with God in a personal, intimate way, more so than they did yesterday, and more so than they will tomorrow, maybe, but you know, hopefully more and more so each day until we come to the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. And to provide those tools and opportunities with which to grow therein, and to offer and offer up to them the ability to go even farther with their own studies. And so, freely. And so, rather than say all that and be labeled, you know, a fanatic, I just kind of say, well, you know, I do an internet thing. You know, because then people ask you, well, you know, what do you do for a living? You know, I'm a minister, I'm a minister on the internet, you know, or I share video. Well, how do you pay for your bills? Well, you know, Instead of saying Lord provides, you know, it's like, oh no, you know, we charge for it. No, I don't. I don't take a seat. I don't offer you the opportunity to pay for what God has given you. I don't proffer for you the ability to be sneaky about it and to work behind the scenes to come find me and pay for it. As a matter of fact, I don't give any opportunity for anyone to do anything except receive. That's all I want to do is give. I don't want to receive. And so in and of itself, that should have been, you know, easy to share and relate. But it wasn't, you see, because I felt like Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet of God, and he came before the, the prophets of Baal, you know, and he said, hey, you know, and he was really adamant about it. I mean, he was like in their face. Hey, tell you what, let's have a contest. You know, you, you put up your altar, I'll put up my altar. You put up your sacrifice, I'll put up my sacrifice. Let's see who's God. Let's get real. I mean, I've done that. I put God on the spot where I've said, hey, you know, one of the worst things, I'll tell you exactly, would be like Elijah. It's like, and you won't like it. <laughs> you might not like it. Some of you are going to laugh about this. You know, some of you old Jesus freaks are going to go, oh, man, I remember those days. Woo. But I have taken this. I walked up to a person and said, you want to hear God speak? Do you want to hear God speak? You want to know whether God's real or not? I'll prove to you he's real. And I'll prove to you by the word of God that he's real because the Holy Spirit will speak to you and he'll talk to you. God will talk to you in this right now. You take this Bible and tell you what. You just flip that sucker open. And you think about what it is you want to ask God. And when you flip it open, you just read. And you and God will know whether or not he's real and why. Because I dare you. I don't dare you. I double dare you. I don't ever do that. I don't dare people because that's tempting. But I say... If you want to know, and it's a big if, and I always use the if because that's what Jesus did. If you want to know, prove it. Here, do it. Otherwise, put up or shut up. Don't tell me there's no God. When I'm willing to put my reputation here, I'm willing to embarrass myself, I'm willing to make a fool of myself to prove to you that God sent me right now to you to demonstrate that He's a real and alive and that you can know so. Because you can prove so. Whew! Talk about scary. The times I've done that? Yeah, scary. Because you risk being a fool and an idiot and a nitwit and a nut if you're doing it outside of God's will. If God sent you to do that, and he did with me at different times to individual people, personally, you don't embarrass them out in front of everyone. You don't make a big stage production of it. God doesn't work that way. Sorry. If you want to work that way, go do a healing ministry. But they would open the Bible. They would be in tears, sort of, you know, and they would read it and they would start changing. You could see it on their face. I don't know what they said, what God said to them. I don't read their scriptures, you know. I know because I saw their face afterwards. And they know because they remember. And if they see this video, they'll remember. And they'll, they'll say, yeah, yeah, I know. Some of them later denied it. 
Some of them later hated me for it. Some of them later thanked me for it. But they did know God spoke to them. There's no doubt. And that's the reality of what Elijah did. Was he put the crux of the situation right where it needed to be. A demonstration of proof and evidence in the obvious, observable means with a practical reality from a spiritual dimension coming and intervening in the, the ways that no man could do by himself. And that's what I did. But see, Elijah, he had this issue with it also, and that's what I want to explain to you. After he had done this to the prophets, you know, he said to them, well, you know, your God's busy, you know, and he said, you know, make your sacrifice. Well, God didn't, their God didn't send down fire from heaven. And, you know, they cut themselves, and they screamed, and they stomped, and romped, and chomped, you know, and they, you know, babbled, and gabbled, and, you know, did whatever they did, you know, like a bunch of chickens with their head cut off, you know, running around, getting louder and worse and everything else, and, you know, and Elijah started making fun of them in, you know, kind of like, kind of provocative way. And being full of pride and being a man of passion, you know, which is what we're told he is, which means a lot more than what you think, you know. But being that he was Elijah, you know, the way he is, he says, "Okay, fine, you're done." So he says, "Tell you what, you know, dig a ditch around my sacrifice, so I dig a ditch and throw water on it, you know, so it fills up, you know, or so it drowns the sacrifice, so they poured water on it, and then they." poured more water on it so they filled up the trench around it and he says, okay God, get it. Poof. Instant. Sacrifice. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, consumed the steam, consumed the thing and took out the prophets of Baal. <laughs> All at the same time. Now, I'm not sure it took out the prophets of Baal, but anyways, we'll end up killing them eventually. But the point being is that there was a proof, a very obvious demonstration that how does soaked sacrifice with water get consumed? How does the wood burn, you know, without it being dried out? In other words, God was able to, people say that God won't, you know, break his own, quote unquote, physical laws of the dimensional reality in our practical world that we live in, the law of dynamics or whatever, or the law of whatever may be at the time. Yes, he will. <laughs> and he did. And that's one example. But the point is, is that at any moment in time, God does things like that, and he can do that if he sends you. And so I was amazed that shortly after that, after he had proven the Lord God was in charge. He had challenged the people to pick their God. He finds out I think it was Jezebel, not one Jezebel. It was, uh... yeah, Jezebel. Jezebel was a, not really a Jew. She was a, I want to say Amorite or Hittite, Hivite, but I'm not sure which she was exactly, top of my head, because I wasn't really thinking of using Jezebel in this example. But she had married the king of Israel, and might have been king of Judah. Got to think about that for a minute, but I'm not sure. If it comes to me, I'll mention it. Things was you know, Israel or Judah, but the point is, is that she was the queen, and um, northern kingdom. So probably, yeah, I want to say, well, it's either northern or southern kingdom, but Israel or Judah. But the point being is that she's the queen, you know, in charge. So she kind of lets word out that she's coming after Elijah, and Elijah heads for the hills. He runs like crazy. He's he's terrified of her. Whoa! This prophet of God was scared. See, when you're used of God, it doesn't mean you're always you know, full of it, you know, with it. Sometimes God will still humble you and bring you, you know, down to a basement. And so Elijah heads off to his cave and winds up being fed by crows and kind of other things, you know. Kind of amazing, you know, that he fearful and ran off and thinking, Whoa, I mean, we're running, you know. God later on shows that there's more people out there than just him. But my point of it is, is that Elijah was fearful. He kind of like wore down or didn't show forth the same kind of ministry that he did when he was standing up bold and courageous. Well, that was kind of like the way I was with this bro, you know. It was like I, I felt intimidated by not having the world's applause, the world's way of looking at things, you know, the manly man kind of point of view, you know, where, oh, well, my vocation was this, you know, and I've done this, you know, and I got this on my, you know, resume, and, you know, I could go out and get this job and that job. Well, no, I can't. You see, 
One of the things about God is he's jealous, first of all. That means he loves you enough to want the best for you, so he's personally jealous over you in your time. He wants you to be with him in some way. If that means in your job, then he gives you a job. If it means in your personal life, he uses you in your personal life. If it's in your vocational, avocation, or ministerial, or whatever may be life, then he uses that. Or he's in all of your life. In my life, I've nearly died three times. I've nearly perished from this body being so deathly that it could not sustain life anymore. And what kept it going, even the doctors were amazed. They did not know. When I walked into the hospital, the emergency room, one time, I remember the look of shock on the doctor's face and the nurses when they ran up to me, grabbed me by the shoulders, lowered me down onto a stretcher, took me into the emergency room, stuck IVs in one arm and in another arm, blood, packed me in ice, you know, put ice underneath my armpits, ice between my legs. It was cold. Ice underneath my um, knees, ice at my feet, and I was packed in ice. And they were lowering my body temp because I had such a raging infernal fever that they were afraid that, you know, brain fry, and I was like, you know, no blood and no everything. And from that moment on, they began to work to restore what little fluid I had, because I had none. I mean, I had such a ridiculous blood count and such a ridiculous fluid count that they were sure there was no reason for me to be alive. And so as they began to you know, bring fluids back into me and give me IV fluids as well as blood and you know, all the other stuff, then later they had to put a central line in my, my heart, a chest you know, here, to feed me intravenously so that I would also receive nutrients there as well as eventually they put intralipids into my arms because you know, it also was able to handle it for a while until they blew and then they put it in my heart. So they gradually put fat back into my body because I had no fat, period. I had no, no fat in my blood system, no fat in my body. I, as you would say, body, whatever it is, that the fat content was just like minus, minus, minus. <laughs> so God, keeping me alive, has always taken me to the place where I do what he wants because when I don't, I fade, so to speak. It's almost as though I just start losing that life essence, that life force. It just seems to seep away, almost like a like a bag with holes in it. You know, it's like the fluids begin to seep out. The life that God has given me begins to fade away, begins to just seep away, begins to drain from me. And it becomes obvious in my life because you can see it in my face. You know, the first place that I lose weight is usually my face and you can just see the drain and drawn look. And, you know, those people that died or that lived through the concentration camps, I looked like that. I remember that two or three times. And what I learned from that was that at those times that I had gone in, I was working. See, I walked in from my job at a 7-Eleven at the time to the hospital room when they packed me in ice and I wound up losing that job because, quite frankly, they found out that I was sick. They didn't care when I showed up for work, you know, and as long as I was working, who cared? But boy, when I, you know, was in the hospital bed, you know, in those days, no insurance. I had VA, thank God, benefits, temporarily. <laughs> you know, it, Reagan took those away. But when I had those benefits, you know, they took care of me. You know, they provided for my health. God provided for that. And so, having gone through those experiences at different times in my life in order to get over my insecurities, my inferiority complex, I would go back to work. I would strive to be the best that I could be, you know, to use my job to identify my character, to prove what kind of Christian I was through my avocation or my vocation and my idealism, thinking that if I was a hard worker, you know, I'd be rewarded. And sure enough, most of my jobs, man, I've had a lot of jobs over 40, you know, I'd say about 30 of them, you know, within a week, I'd get promoted. I'd be moved up and moved into different positions of responsibility and given, you know, rewards for the job that I've done and, you know, different times kept at different times, you know, and prospered. And at different times, God moved me out of them through either illness or whatever it may have been, catastrophic events. And sometimes I quit, you know, once in a while, you know, God said, go, and I went, you know, I said, okay, you know, I'm done, you know, it's interesting. And I used to 
play that off in some way by telling people, well, you know, you know, I've worked a year here, you know, and then I get bored, I try something else. Well, it wasn't always that. It wasn't really that I wanted to learn more. It was sometimes that God said go. And I just didn't want to tell people that because after a while, you tell them that and they think you're nuts. Well, you know. <laughs> well, well. And explaining yourself isn't what God wants you to do. God never said explain yourself. He recorded our lives in his book of remembrance. He has our lives recorded way beyond before we were ever born. He knows everything we're doing, we've done, the good, the bad, the things that were in sin, the things that were in righteousness, the things that were failings, the things that were, were in success. God never intended for you to be the epitome of a business success to prove your Christianity. That has nothing to do with your Christianity. Your success in business has nothing to do with your relationship with God. It is true that as you have a relationship with God, it can help to enhance your success in business. God may bless your business and may cause you to succeed in business. For myself, hey, I could succeed in business, no problem. I can succeed at just about any job that I put my mind to because I know how to make money. But that's not what the gift of God is to us. He's given us grace and mercy. He's given us the ability to have relationship so that we're not defined by our jobs. We're not resigned to some kind of esteem that people put on each other by your looking at someone and saying, oh, look at them, huh, they're overweight. Oh, look at them, they're a model. Oh, look at them, they're a, a gosh, I don't even know. They're an ethnic group, there we go. <laughs> they're, they're black, yellow, red, white, green, purple. You know? Look at them, oh, they're tall, oh, they're short. Ooh, they got blue eyes, ooh, they got green eyes. No, you're not defined by that. You're not resigned to those kind of judgment calls. God has a perspective of you that you're defined by him and his definition of you is what he's done for you you see he loved you so much he said I'm first of all I'm gonna give you life and then I'm gonna give you the freedom of choice because you can choose whatever you want to do I want you to grow up free I want you to be able to choose the kind of life you want to live but I also want to give you an opportunity of something else this thing we Christians call eternal life, but the fact is, I want to let you know there's more to life than what you're going to just be born into. That I want you to develop in your life a recognition of something more than what you see, touch, and feel. That eventually you'll come to a reality that there's got to be more. And then you can call out and I'll be there. And that's what God does to people in life. He arranges their circumstances till they finally figure out there is more to life than just what we think we're experiencing, even the good of it. A lot of people when they're young, you know, they think they've got it made until they start getting older and realize, wow, is that all there was? Is that all there is? I've run my race, I've finished my course, I've done everything I wanted to do, I've had all the boys and toys and girls and, you know, success and failures and really, that's, that's what life is? And God says, no, that's not. Watch, let me show you something. And that's what Elijah did. He wanted to show and demonstrate to the children of Israel they'd missed out on something. They'd forgotten something. The Lord their God. The creator of the universe. The person who actually gave them life. I know everybody thinks that somehow you get life just by, you know, a man and a woman procreating. There's a little more to that than that. If you think that's all there is, go ahead. Try to have a baby when you want a baby. <laughs> doesn't usually happen that way, you know, you got to go out and probably take mega pills, you know, and wind up like an octomom or something, but the point is, God gives life, and God stops life, you know, the old expression is, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, and it's true, the reality of that is a fact, God is the author of life, and he's the finisher of life, as we know it, we do know that because he initiates life, we live for eternity, whether in heaven or hell, but when Elijah put the demonstration of that back in front of the children of Israel, they had to come to a conclusion about what he had done. Either he's one heck of a magician, or there's something more to life than what we know, or what we've been doing. And that's what happened in my life, is that I had to come to a conclusion with all that I went through in my life of trying to live up to the world's standards, the world's model of having the perfect wife, which I never did, having the perfect set number of children, which I never did, having the perfect vocation or job, having the perfect resume, which I never did, 
As a matter of fact, I never had anything quite the way most people have it. Most people say, well, you know, those Jesus freaks, they all got saved because they were a bunch of drug addicts and hippies and, you know, they were all messed up and they were all screwed up and they were all like a bunch of weirdos. Well, I wasn't. I was actually a pretty normal kid. Hippie, but, you know, I had long hair because I was protesting, but I was more like a beatnik hippie. But then my life fell apart after I got saved because that's what God intended for it to be. So there would be that ability at the end of my life to minister the things of my life in the way that God chose to arrange my life, to not fit into the box that most people fit into. And there's nothing wrong with normalcy, don't get me wrong. I am thoroughly amazed and I was thoroughly intimidated by the world I was telling you about from the beginning. He has a wonderful wife. He has wonderful children. He has a wonderful church he goes to, a dynamic ministry. He has had very few needs or necessities to go beyond one or two jobs, you know, or three or four, I don't know how many, maybe one or two. And he's still in the vocation. And some of the people that are in that same fellowship or that church that I go to have done the same. They've grown up straight as a planting of the Lord, you know, like in a farmer's community. They have, every year that field has produced a harvest. And it's produced the same harvest, the same fruit, and the fruit is put into barns, and the barns are garnished, and it's fed to the people. Praise the Lord. There are normal things like that in the world. Don't think that the world is, you know, the way Christians define it on news or trying to make a topical point about somehow the whole thing's falling apart. I got news for you. There are people that are normal out there, that are living normal lives without watching the news every day, without being caught up in the world in its ways, without getting all wrapped up in things that are, you know, making people paranoid and panic-stricken, and they're living comfortable, meaningful, respectable lives. I'm just not one of them. <laughs> uh, you know, when, when things fall apart, I'm good at it. When things are going smooth, not so good. You know, kind of like, I'm always, like, intimidated by it. You know, and that's what happened was that in this bro that I was sharing with, I just didn't really want to share about, you know, video or the ministry. I just wanted to kind of like, you know, more more hear about him and what God was doing with him. You know, and they're more like kind of like, you know, well, you know, we, we like this and we like that. And I'm oh, yeah, that's nice, you know. And I'm kind of like foreign to me. And I have a brother-in-law the same way. He grew up and he stayed at the same job. He's been in the same job all his life, railroad, of course, so don't really get out of that one. But, you know, he's had a wonderful life. Of course, he married my sister, so he's really whacked out. But, <laughs> but his life in and of itself is a testimony. And don't be intimidated like Elijah was, or like I was, you know, to ever have to explain your life, you know, or try to rearrange, you know, what God has done in your life. It is what it is, and that's the way it is. You're saved by grace. There's no other way you are saved. You're not saved because you were perfect. You're not saved because you're righteous. You're not saved because you're holy. You're not saved because you're going to create a perfect environment for your children. You know, you may go through a divorce. You may go through multiple divorces. I have. You know, some were my... One, I think, was my fault. One... Yeah, maybe just one. But, I mean, everybody's really at fault. Whenever there's a divorce, everybody's at fault. Whether it be the person that married them, whether it be the community that served them, whether it be the places they lived, whether it be the people they were affected by, whether it be the society they were part of, whether it be their learning environment, whether it be their own choices, their own learning curve, their own emotional instability, their own emotional immaturity. Divorce is not something that's just one person doing to another person. I mean, quite frankly... That's not the only end result. There's a whole lot more that's affected, and it affects everything in society. While it says that it takes a community to raise a child, believe me, it takes a community to keep a marriage together, <laughs> or divorce. You know, it affects the entire community. And that's the thing that we hadn't really realized until recently, where people began to see, ooh, this is a societal effect. It affects everything spiritually. And not just divorce, because divorce is just a symptom of a problem that exists deeper than that. And so, you may go through divorces for a learning process. You may go through children 
as a learning process. You may do well or fail well. You may be the, like my mother was, the other woman, or you may be the right woman. You know, you've been stabbed in the back by a pastor, or you know, you've been beat up by a minister, or whatever it may be. You somehow they failed you in some capacity. But that's learning, believe it or not. That's experience that you can take to God and say, What's up with this? And God will say, Let me show you. And He'll show you through the Word of God exactly your life according to either an Old Testament example, or He'll give you something in life that'll motivate you to discover that He is the author of life and the finisher of your faith. He's going to provide for you all the days of your life. He's going to take care of you. He's going to be with you because He's your God and you're His child, His person, His man or woman of God. And it may not look perfect to you, but you know, one thing I learned about God, His imperfect, our imperfection is God's perfection. That's just the way it is. I don't know any other way to say it simpler than that. And if you could figure that one out and make it a banner on your forehead or a forefront, you know, in front, a front leg in front of your eyes, you know, then it would probably spare you all the agony I went through for years of ministry and years of Christians and pastors and people that I've ministered to. If you could just recognize that our imperfection is God's perfection, then you'll recognize that that scripture that says, you know, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, you know, the broken things, you know, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, searching all over the world for whom he may act strong on their behalf. Yeah, I mean, you can put all the scriptures to it that you want to. But the bottom line is, it's still a scriptural, factual statement. And that's the only kind that I like, because <laughs> otherwise I'll even criticize myself on using cliches. But his imperfection, I mean, our imperfection is his perfection. And that's what you are in Jesus, because God has made you perfect according to his will, according to his way, and in his time. Because right now, it may be your learning process, or it may be your teaching process, but don't let the process define you. Rather, let God remind you who you are in him.